Lydian, beware of the day when a mule is lord of the Medians. Then, with thy delicate feet by the stone-strewn channel of Hermas, flee for thy life, nor abide nor blush for the name of a craven. The Oracle of Delphi to Croesus, King of Lydia Welcome to Very Old Money, a podcast that looks at history through money. Episode 2.2 He Shall Destroy a Mighty Empire A quick announcement before we begin. The podcast is now available on most podcatchers, including Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. You can also subscribe to it on YouTube. And the link for that is available on my website at veryoldmoney.com. The coins listed on the cover art for today's episode and on the website are again from Classical Numismatic Group LLC and you can view their site at www.cngcoins.com and on with the show. At the end of last week's episode, we ended with Aliati's King of Lydia handing over the throne to his son Croesus. Croesus would be the fifth generation descendant of Gyges and the subject of the likely ex post facto prediction by the Oracle of Delphi. The stories of his wealth have gone down in legend with the phrase, as rich as Croesus, entering the lexicon. Herodotus tells us that he came to the throne at 35 after putting down a rival faction that supported his half-brother. He continued his father's campaigns against the Ionian Greeks and finally brought them under his control. However, he appears to have maintained friendly relations with the Greeks on the other side of the Aegean. Herodotus credits the Lydians with the first gold and silver coins, and these are generally attributed to the reign of Croesus. Since the first Indian coins are almost exclusively in silver, these gold coins likely are the first gold coins minted anywhere. The transition from Electrum started with gold coins of about 10.7 grams, and that's three-fourths the weight of the old Lydian Electrum stator. This likely represents the value of gold to the value of the old electrum stator. It has been speculated that this was a transitional coinage intended to remove the old electrum coins from circulation. As noted earlier, the coins today are from CNG and the gold coin at the top of today's cover art is one of these earlier coins at about 17 millimeters and 10.77 grams. The lonely lion from the electrum stators and the cojoin lions are both gone and now it is a lion facing a bull. One of the distinguishing factors on this coin compared to later coins is that the four legs of the lion and the bull are bent at 90 degrees. The symbolism of the lion and the bull has been debated. From the sun and the moon, the spring and the winter based on when the constellations Leo and Taurus fell, strength and fertility, Asia and Europe, perhaps referring to Croesus subduing the Ionian Greeks. And this particular motif is carried on later in coinage in the region, well after Croesus, often with the lion hunting and feasting on the bull. The head of the lion has a small pellet. This is a carryover from the earlier electrum coinage, but then it later disappears on later bimetallic coins. This pellet, along with the extreme rarity of these coins, suggests that the coin in this picture was a transitional issue. The next series of coins issued was bimetallic the first bimetallic precious metal coinage issued anywhere. The weight of the gold stator was reduced to 8.1 grams and is now accompanied by a silver stator of 10.7 grams. It's believed that the value of silver to gold at this time was 13 is to 1. So 10 silver stators would be worth about 1 gold stator. The reverses of these coins, like the earlier Electrum coins, have two inquise punches for the large denominations and one for the smaller one. And the smaller denominations again have a wide variety from one-third staters to one-forty-eighth stator. And the second coin in the cover art is a silver stator from this particular bimetallic issue and it's about 19.5 millimeters and 10.63 grams. And obviously now a bimetallic coinage provides a great deal of benefit for commercial transactions because now you're dealing with pure gold and pure silver coins and you don't have to worry about whether the gold in the electrum has been debased and the amount of gold has been reduced. 
Herodotus narrates a story about Croesus meeting the sage Solon, and Croesus showed Solon his fabulous wealth. He then asked Solon who was the happiest man in the world. Solon identified three men. One of them, Tellus, who died fighting for his country after seeing his sons prosperous and well-established, and then two brothers, Cleobus and Biton, who died peacefully in their sleep after their mother prayed for their perfect happiness because they had demonstrated filial piety by drawing her to the festival in an ox cart by themselves when the oxen did not come in from the fields on time. This naturally did not make Croesus very happy, but then Solon went on to tell him that the happiness of Croesus cannot be judged until his death, because fortune is fickle. Now this may not necessarily be an actual tale, but it has all the hallmarks of an allegorical tale because the rest of the story of Croesus in Herodotus is basically an allegorical warning of hubris. This started with the son of Croesus, Atis. Croesus had a dream where his son was killed by a spear of iron. And one day a mighty boar threatened the countryside and the prince wanted to go and join the hunt. And Atis convinced his father by pointing out that boars do not wield iron. But just to be safe, Croesus sent along Adrastus of Phrygia as a bodyguard. Unfortunately on the hunt, when the hunters threw spears at the boar, the one from Adrastus killed Atis. Adrastus had previously been expelled from Phrygia for accidentally killing his brother and now he committed suicide at the blood guilt of another accident. And Greek myths generally do not have happy endings. Now we did not know the historicity of this and the father of Adrastus mentioned in Herodotus' story is not being identified from other sources. But naturally the death of his son threw Croesus into grief. And as this was going on, a new threat was rising in the East. There are very few people in history who have received an almost universal good press as the King Kurush, better known as Cyrus the Great. Cyrus is the only non-Jewish person in the Old Testament to be referred to as the Lord's Anointed, basically a messiah. The mythology of the origin story of Cyrus follows a number of common motifs of the legendary hero. It starts with a prophecy that a newborn or assumed to be born will overthrow a tyrant or cause some calamity. If the identity of the child is known, either the mother is sent to a certain death or the child is to be executed at birth. If the identity is not known, a large slaughter of newborns is ordered. And of course, this does not work. By some intercession, be it divine or human, the child is spared, survives, and then returns as an adult to fulfill his destiny. This is the general outline for the story of the birth of Perseus in Greek mythology. Paris, prince of Troy, who was prophesied to bring about the ruin of his homeland. Moses in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, Romulus and Remus in Roman mythology, and Krishna in Hinduism. And so it is with Cyrus. Herodotus gives us a delightful mythological account of Cyrus's early life. According to the story, the king of Media, Astyages, who was the brother-in-law of Croesus, had a prophetic dream where enough water flowed from his daughter, Mandane, to cover his kingdom in all of Asia. Now to forestall this and avoid any grandson from being a threat, he married her off to a harmless vassal named Cambyses, king of Anshan. The Persians are still minor players at this point, carving out a subsidiary kingdom in the old Elamite heartland. However, this marriage did not stop the dreams of King Astyages. Because then, after the marriage, he had a second one, where a series of fruit-bearing vines emerged from his daughter, covering all of Asia. And Mandani by this point was pregnant, and so when she gave birth to Cyrus, Astyages hands over the baby to his general, Harpagus, to kill the child. And of course, Harpagus cannot do it, so he outsources the job to a shepherd, who just had a stillborn son, so he substitutes the child with his stillborn son. And so, the young prince is raised as a shepherd. When he was about 10, the boy comes to Astyages' attention by having the son of a nobleman beaten in a childhood game. Now, how likely is it that a son of a nobleman is going to be playing games with a shepherd's kid? But let's go on with the story. When Astyages interviews the boy and his adoptive father, the shepherd, confesses, Astyages realizes who the boy is and that Harpagus has betrayed him. Cyrus was then sent to live with his real parents, 
and Astyages takes his vengeance on Harpagus by killing Harpagus' child and serving the child to him at a banquet. And then, after the feast is over, bringing the heads, hands and feet of the son on platters so that Harpagus can realize that he just ate his child. Now much of Herodotus' tale seems a bit too fantastic, and this is not uncommon for Herodotus. He has a tendency to go for the most exciting folk tales, and while he is generally known as the father of history, he also has a less flattering title, the father of lies. Now sending Cyrus back to his parents with a, oops, my bad, I failed to kill him 10 years ago, this would have been a very awkward conversation. And then keeping on Harpagus as a general after the brutal murder of his son, just so that he can conveniently betray him, takes hubris into the ranks of utter stupidity. Now, it's generally accepted that Cyrus was the son of Cambyses, king of Anshan, as noted in his own proclamation. Now, it is possible he was the grandson of Astyages, but no dreams are needed to explain the eventual war with the Medes. As the kingdom of Anshan expanded across the heartlands of the ancient Elamite Empire, it is likely that Astyages grew concerned about his suddenly too powerful vassal. So the two states went to war. Herodotus narrates three battles culminating in Harpagus inciting a mutiny that led to the fall of the Median Empire. Now, it does appear that some sort of mutiny did actually take place. The Nabonidus Chronicle, named after Nabonidus, king of Babylon, who we will get to later in a separate episode, which is now preserved in a clay tablet at the British Museum, notes the following. King Astyages called up his troops and marched against Cyrus, king of Anshan, in order to meet him in battle. The army of Astyages revolted against him, and in fetters they delivered him to Cyrus. Cyrus marched against the country, Ekbatana, the royal residence, he seized, silver, gold, and other valuables of the country, Ekbatana, he took as his booty and brought to Anshan. So, helped by mutiny, Cyrus overcame the Median Empire. He appears to have spared the life of Astyages, and he may have married his daughter as part of a peace offering. And this eventually won him the fealty of the former vassals of the Median Empire. The sudden fall of Media to what was basically an unknown group of people probably came as a shock to much of the Near East. And this threatened the delicate balance of power that had existed for the last 50 odd years. According to Herodotus, the fall of his brother-in-law brought Croesus out of his grief for the death of his son, and he contemplated war with the Persian upstart. However, being cautious, he decided to seek the advice of various oracles. Before we go further, it is time to incorporate some wisdom from George R.R. R. Martin's A Song of Fire and Ice, which was the HBO show A Game of Thrones. And these are the wise words of Tyrion Lannister regarding prophecy. Prophecy is like a half-trained mule. It looks as though it might be useful, but the moment you trust in it, it kicks you in the head. Not being acquainted with the wise dwarf, Croesus went ahead with his plan. Herodotus is in his element here, as he narrates the story of Croesus first testing the various oracles by sending messengers to them to ask them what was he doing at that very instant. Only two oracles, the oracle of Delphi and the one at Amphiaros passed his test. Now to these he sent additional gifts and he sent an additional question. Shall Croesus send an army against the Persians and shall he take to himself any allied host? Both oracles responded that if he sent an army against the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. And both of them told him to discover the mightiest of the Greeks and make them his friends. This sounded great to Croesus, so he sent a final inquiry to Delphi, asking if his sovereignty would be of long duration. And to this, he got the answer at the beginning of the podcast. Excited and thinking that a literal mule could never rule media, he decided to go to war. And this is where the figurative half-trained mule would eventually kick him in the head. Because Cyrus, the likely half-Persian, half-Mede, was a mule of a different sort. After investigating the Greeks, Croesus went on to form an alliance with Sparta as the strongest Greek state. This added to his existing alliances with Nabonidus of Babylon and Amasis II of Egypt. And with this, he went to war in 547 BC. After crossing the Halys, Croesus met the Persians in battle at Terra. Battle was bloody and inconclusive, 
and thinking he had inflicted enough harm on the Persians to end the campaigning for the winter, Croesus decided to withdraw and returned back to Sardis. He then sent messages to his allies, asking them to arrive for the next campaigning season. And fatefully, he made the decision to disband part of his army and send the levies home. Unfortunately, he was dealing with an opponent who thought outside the box. Instead of dismissing his own levies, Cyrus decided to follow Croesus to Sardis and caught him by surprise. Croesus gave Cyrus battle with the troops he had available, and he may still have had a numerical advantage, but things did not go well. According to Herodotus, Cyrus placed camels to disrupt the Lydian cavalry, and when they were driven off, they wheeled in to take the Lydian infantry in the center. The Lydian army disintegrated, and Croesus was forced to flee behind the walls of Sardis and hope he could hold out long enough for his allies to assemble and for him to recall his levies. Unfortunately, the Spartans were tied up in a war with Argos and did not show up. Neither did the Babylonians or Egyptians. Two weeks after the siege began, Cyrus found a portion of the wall that was not adequately defended because of a misguided faith in the steepness of the ground outside the walls. From here, the Persians poured over the walls and took the city. There are differing accounts on the fate of Croesus. According to one, he was burnt alive along with his family. According to another, as the flames were lit, he called out to Solon, acknowledging the fickleness of fate. When Cyrus heard this, he ordered him saved. And according to one account, it was too late. According to another account, a sudden rainstorm extinguished the fire, saving Croesus. And after this, he spent out his days as a loyal advisor to Cyrus and then his son. And he shows up often in Herodotus as an advisor to Cyrus. According to the Nabonidus Chronicle, around the same time as the fall of Croesus in 546 BC, Cyrus marched against the country and killed its king. It is possible this refers to Lydia and the death of Croesus, but the name of the king is missing from the inscription. Personally, given his track record for clemency, I find it hard to believe that Cyrus would burn Croesus alive. He may have died in the capture of Sardis or soon after, but this is all conjecture. By going to war with Persia, Croesus did destroy a mighty empire, his own. Lydia was now incorporated into the Persian Empire, and we will return to its fate three episodes from now. But before we get there, we will have to go back in time to the cities of Ionia and their earliest coinage, which came contemporaneously or soon after the first Lydian electrum coins. So on the next episode, the first Ionian coins. See you soon.